All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our BCBA exam practice series where we're going through the next set of questions together on the sixth BCBA practice exam and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please subscribe if you have not already. Be sure to check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack and practice exams. As always, when you pass, please let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. Violet and Autumn love going to Target with their dad because he always buys them something. Their dad tells them before they go to Target, each girl must complete five math problems and read 20 minutes of a book of their choice. What type of schedule does this most resemble? We have a schedule question. When we talk about schedules, we're talking about basic schedules and compound schedules. Compound schedules are simply schedules that are made up of two or more basic schedules. So your first objective in a schedule question is identifying, well, what are the schedules? We know before the kids, Violet and Autumn, can go to Target, their dad says they must first complete five math problems. That's your first basic schedule. So after five problems or five responses, so some sort of FR5 maybe, and read 20 minutes. So now we have an interval schedule as well. So we have a ratio schedule, five responses. We have an interval schedule, 20 minutes, and the girls must do both, right? They must complete five math problems and read 20 minutes. So they've got to do both of these schedules. What type of schedule does that resemble? A, concurrent. When you see concurrent, you want to think choice. You want to think choosing something, choosing between schedules, choice. The girls aren't choosing. They have to complete both schedules to go to Target. So A is out. What about B, alternative? Alternative and conjunctive. And the, the secret to compound schedules is to think about these in pairs because alternative and conjunctive are more or less a pair, right? These are compound schedules that feature a ratio schedule and an interval schedule. The difference is in an alternative schedule, only one of the schedules needs to be completed. So it's the either or idea. In a conjunctive schedule, both schedules have to be completed. And that's what we're dealing with here. Alternative would say each girl could complete five math problems or read 20 minutes. Instead, it says each girl must complete five math problems and read 20 minutes. Therefore, this is going to be conjunctive. Why is it not chained? Well, chained insinuates that there is a specific order with SDs indicating the order. There's no indication here that they have to do this in any specific order. It's not necessarily chained. However, they must do both to get the reinforcement. Therefore, the schedule is conjunctive. Don't get psyched out about compound schedules. Don't spend too much time on it. One of those topics that I always say save till last if it's really confusing you. Don't get yourself overwhelmed by compound schedules. Save it for last if it's confusing. If not, these should be easy points, but don't get overwhelmed by compound schedules. That's all I can tell you about that, okay? They're not as intimidating as they seem once you get a hang of them. 136, Margaret asks her friends what they want to drink. One of her friends says, I'll take a Dr. Pepper. Another one of her friends says, I'll take any soft drink you have. Margaret then brings over two Dr. Peppers. What is exemplified by both Dr. Pepper and soft drink? A couple things here. The question is asking about both of these, right? They're asking about the Dr. Pepper and soft drink together, both Dr. Pepper and soft drink. Well, let's look what happens in the question. Margaret says, what do you want to drink? First friend says, I'll take a Dr. Pepper. Second friend says, I'll take any soft drink. As a result, she brings two Dr. Peppers. So these two responses do what? Well, they evoke the same behavior, they have the same effect on the environment. Dr. Pepper and soft drink both get Dr. Pepper. So what is exemplified by both these things? A, a single response. So since we're discussing Dr. Pepper and soft drink together, this keyword both, right, you don't want to pick single response or single behavior, all right, because we're talking about them together. Now, you might say, well, couldn't that be the best answer? Potentially, but there's a better answer here. Why is there a better answer? 
because we have B, a response class. The response class here is Dr. Pepper and soft drink, because those are the that they make up a response class, which gets drinks, which gets Dr. Peppers, even though they're they're different in topography. Dr. Pepper and soft drink are spoken, but they don't look the same, right? They both evoke the same outcome. So they are part of a response class. They're not a formal stimulus class because, again, they look different. Dr. Pepper and soft drink are not topographically similar. What happens is when both are said, Margaret then brings over Dr. Peppers. So they're part of the same response class, making this the best answer. 137, which of the following measurement strategies is most likely to underestimate the rate of behavior? All right, you might get some of these questions about measurement and some of the, the issues we might have. And a lot of times that's going to be with discontinuous measurements because as we know with discontinuous measurement, we're only taking a sample of the actual behavior, meaning that the, the data aren't actually always going to be the best, right? In this case, we're looking at the measurement strategy that could underestimate rate of behavior. So let's think about what rate is. Rate is the frequency over the times, the count over the time. Now, if we're thinking about discontinuous measurement and how we are recording, we have our intervals and each interval gets one data point. And so if I'm using whole interval recording, the behavior must occur that entire time. So if I have 15 second intervals, the behavior has to occur for 15 seconds. If it of course occurs 14 seconds, it doesn't count. Now, why is that a problem for rate? Well, my data are going to indicate that the behavior didn't happen at all, when in reality it happened for 14 seconds, just not the full 15. So when it comes down to it and I add up everything, I add my count, my frequency is going to be lower than really what actually happened. So we're underestimating the frequency, therefore we're underestimating the rate. But now what is partial interval doing? Well, partial interval does the opposite, right? Because partial interval, the behavior only has to happen for a split second and it counts for that entire time. So partial interval is going to tend to, un to overestimate the rate of behavior, or in other words, uh, tends to indicate that it's happening more than it actually is, while whole interval recording tends to indicate it happens less than it actually is. Momentary time sampling could be either because it's going to happen at a moment in time. So it's going to be very just by chance what momentary time sampling effect has on the data. It could underestimate, it could overestimate. Play check is just momentary time sampling in a group. So it's going to be that same randomness. The, the whole interval recording measurement strategy is much more likely to underestimate the rate of behavior compared to these other three. 138, a child gets a jack-in-the-box for Christmas. Anytime the handle on this toy is rotated enough times, the clown puppet jumps out of the box. When this happens, the child jumps and laughs. After a couple of days, the child is no longer jumping and is only smiling when the puppet comes out of the box. What likely happened? All right, let's take a look at the scenario. What likely happened. We have this child. They get a jack-in-the-box. Whenever they rotate the handle, the clown puppet jumps out of the box. When the clown puppet jumps out of the box, the child jumps and the child laughs. Now, after a couple of days, what's happening to those reflexes? Because jumping and laughing are a reflex, right? And so, at least in this situation where the startle effect from the puppet is causing the jumping and the laughing. So after a couple of days, the child is not jumping and is only smiling. Why? What happened? A, habilitation. Now, let's not get habilitation and habituation confused. Habilitation is when we change the repertoire of our learners so that they're contacting more reinforcement and contacting less punishment. When you habilitate somebody, you improve their lives in a meaningful way. Think about people coming out of rehab or maybe prison. When we habilitate them back into their lives, we're trying to increase how much reinforcement they're getting from their day to day and decreasing the punishment. Habituation, however, is typically associated with respondent conditioning, where these reflexes, the more you're exposed to a stimuli, the lower the magnitude of the response. And that's what's occurring here. 
the repeated presentation of the clown jumping out of the box, which initially called jumping and la- caused jumping and laughing, well, after repeated exposure to the same stimuli, the response is going to decrease in magnitude. So the child is no longer jumping and is only smiling. So what's happened or likely is habituation. Remember, regression is not in our vocabulary, okay? When we're just informally discussing things, maybe, but never formally. And then operant extinction. Well, operant extinction has to do with consequence maintained behavior. We don't know the consequence here. We know the the antecedent, puppet jumps out. We know the response. That's all we know, SR. So we're much more focused on the respondent ID here. So what likely happened was the child was habituated or habituation. The streets in your neighborhood are going to be under construction on different days over the next month. The night before construction starts, signs are put up on the roads that say no parking. Violators will be towed. The signs are functioning as what? Let's think about this. We have these signs, and the signs tell you, or well, before that, you know construction is coming. So they put up signs that tell you no parking. Violators will be towed. No parking indicates if you park there, you're going to be towed. What happens if you don't park there? Well, you're not going to be towed. You're going to avoid being towed. So how are SDs formed? Well, SDs are just stimuli are formed because in the presence of an antecedent, a response is followed by a consequence. So could this be an SD for negative reinforcement? Absolutely. The sign is the SD. No parking. In response, let's say you park somewhere else, the consequence is you've avoided towing. You've been negatively reinforced. The threat is removed. What about B, SD for punishment? Well, if you read the sign, it says no parking, and then you park there, what's going to happen to you? You're going to get punished because your car is going to be towed. So the sign can function as the SD for negative reinforcement or for punishment, depending on your response. Why is, it not, why is it not an S delta for punishment? Because the sign is signaling punishment is available. It's saying if you park here, you will be towed. The S delta is the opposite of the SD. It, it's indicating something is, it's, it's not indicating that anything is available, right? But the sign, since it is indicating punishment is available, it cannot be an S delta. So the sign is both. It's going to depend on your response, what the consequence is. So the signs are, fun- are functioning as an SD for negative reinforcement, and an SD for punishment, both A and B. 140, following a one-month intervention, an adult client's appropriate behavior increased nearly 200% compared to baseline. The adult client told the analyst that they weren't even aware that reinforcement was occurring. What is the term for this phenomenon? What phenomenon are we looking at? Notice how we always start with the question prompt. What is the question asking? Well, the, the, the phenomenon is, the adult client said, I wasn't even aware that reinforcement was occurring. What do we call it when a consequence is affecting somebody, specifically reinforcement, without them even knowing? Because the learner or the subject does not have to be aware of the consequence. It is still going to affect their behavior. So what is the term for that phenomenon? A, contiguity. What does contiguity say? Contiguity refers to the closeness. Refers to the closeness of the reinforcement or consequence, meaning when a response happens, we want contiguity to be as quick as possible. We want that reinforcement, that consequence to follow immediately. That's what we mean by contiguity. What we mean by automaticity is this idea that the person doesn't have to be aware of the consequence for that consequence to have an effect on behavior. That's what's occurring here. Automatic just means not socially mediated. That's one of our functions. Don't get automaticity and automatic confused. They're different. And then elicit is what happens with in respondent behavior when a stimulus elicits a reflex. So what is happening here? What is the term for this phenomenon where the client is not even aware of the consequence yet it affects the behavior? Well, that's going to be automaticity. And then 141, if you're a behavior analyst, If you, a behavior analyst, were going to explain a procedure to a parent, which of the following answer choices would be the most appropriate way to do that? Anytime you get a question asking how you would explain something, 
how you would talk to somebody that is not your technician who is not trained, what are you avoiding? Think about what you're going to avoid. You're going to avoid jargon. You're going to avoid technical language. You want to explain it as simply as possible. So if you're going to explain a procedure to a parent, what is the most appropriate way to do that? A, we are going to use a differential reinforcement of diminishing rates to decrease the maladaptive target behavior. With A, what's the issue? Well, now you have to explain what this means, differential reinforcement, what differential reinforcement of diminishing rates means as well, and then maybe even maladaptive. A lot of jargon, a lot of technical language. A is not good. B, by removing the earned token following the problem behavior, we can guarantee that the problem behavior will decrease. What's the problem there? Well, we never guarantee a change in behavior because you can't. Never, ever guarantee anything. You'll get yourself in trouble. We don't guarantee any outcomes for anything. C, you should praise your daughter immediately after she uses her words to ask for something. Okay. Easy enough, right? And if they press you, then you can explain that it's reinforcement. But this is as simple as it gets. Praise your daughter when she uses her words to ask for something. Very, very straightforward, very straightforward way to explain a procedure. And then D, continuous use of reinforcement is an effective way to increase the target behavior. Better, but still jargony. Continuous use of reinforcement. What does that mean? What is the target behavior? Keep it simple, as simple as possible. The most simple explanation here is C. You should praise your daughter immediately after she uses her words to ask for something. Thank you for watching. Check out BehaviorAnalystStudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. Subscribe if you have not already. Let us know when you pass. Work hard. Study hard. See you soon.